Good morning. We we are in the in our second and last session. We are not all, but I hope people will will arrive. And now uh, Ognen is going to present his research. And I hope I hope you you will enjoy. And as I don't know how much how many of you you will if you will go or not, I want just to thank you your assistance and your collaboration, mm -hmm. your participation, because I think it has been really great for us to, to stay with you and to share this, this research. So, Ongnen, thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you for the kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to be in Valencia and especially to be part of this uh, very interesting and inspiring uh, Seminar. Uh, so my name is Ognan Marina. I'm a professor at the Faculty of Architecture in Skopje, in Macedonia, and I was a part of the Oikonet uh, project, uh, participating in the community uh, participation subnetwork. Uh, however, being an architect uh, with a strong engineering background, but also with uh, a strong interest in research and practice teaching in the design studio. Uh, when it comes to the community participation, uh, it has uh, my interest and my focus has been uh, uh, settled to, to some very basic points that I will raise during my part uh, presentation and uh, will contemplate about uh, the possible theoretical background. And uh, finally, we'll present a short uh, case study that we did uh, trying to grasp uh, what uh, can be understood hopefully as a, uh, as a uh, strong uh, or at least a feasible theoretical uh, background for this kind of a, uh, for better understanding of the community participation and how the community participation is shaping the habitat today. So I decided to have uh, my uh, opening uh, image uh, with the work of the British pop artist uh, Richard Hamilton, which was uh, curiously entitled uh, just what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing. Uh, it is, I will use it uh, to showcase uh, the complexity, but also the temporality of the concepts and ideas that these pop-up artists and the pop-up art in general used in order to uh, comment and to, to complement uh, the society at that time. So. Uh, all, but also on the, uh, I will seize the technique of the pop art in a sense of the collage, uh, bringing up uh, something that is already there, but also putting some uh, provocation, some controversy, and uh, reflecting on what the society is today and what uh, the, the family is, but also the relations between the, the elements and the consumerism today. Uh, so for me, as I said, uh, when thinking about community participation, it comes to the two main questions. As, a, as I said, as a practicing architect, but also as a researcher and a teacher. When uh, we talk about community participation, it's always important to know why does community participation matter, as a general question, but also, or even more, how does it affect architecture, or even more specifically, the, the design of architecture, the process, process of designing the architecture. Uh, because the community participation has regained its importance in the last decade within the context of the crisis of the society that has challenged the very nature of our social systems and the institutions and has utterly surpassed beyond its financial emergence. And especially habitat uh, dwelling, housing, has been always in the center of this crisis. At the very beginning, with the uh, real estate boom, but also at the very end, or let's say at the very peak of the crisis with the housing bubble that uh, initiated the, the, the financial crisis from 2008. Uh, the root of the current interest in community participation and the issues that have been raised about the legitimation of the leading institutions in the society and the decision affecting its development can also be recognized in the post-Second uh, World War development and reconstruction of Europe that was heavily uh, devastated during the war, 
but even more in the uh, follow-up uh, of the community consciousness in 1960s and the reaction to the highly centralized strategies of development in the 70s and 80s. Here on this picture, depicting the moment when the students and the participants and the, in 1968 Mianale, uh, Milan uh, Design Triennale were taking over the Triennale, uh, paradoxically, in the year that was, the Triennale was curated by Giancarlo Di Carlo, one of the forefathers of the community participation in the field of architecture and, uh, uh, and urban planning, later developing the plans for some of the uh, cities in, uh, and the developments in Italy. However, if we consult some of the global players in the field of the urban development, supporting and enabling the urban development, and their reflections, like the World Bank Group, but also the United Nations, uh, we will see that uh, the community participation, uh, specifically when it comes to the World Bank, in a document uh, similarly uh, entitled uh, Why Does Particip Community Participation Matters, you will find that uh, in the perspective of this uh, bank, uh, of this uh, huge uh, support of the urban development throughout the world, it comes uh, to the question of the efficiency of the programs and uh, the uh, aid that they are providing for the, de for the redevelopment. So the problem is that the top-down development aid was deeply disconnected from the needs of the poor, the marginalized and the excluded, the one that uh, the, the aid was focused. So uh, for these global players, uh, when it comes to community participation, it comes to the issue of politics and uh, uh, policies and how to utilize, uh, how to improve the process of the urban development and initiating and uh, uh, financing it. But uh, from my point of view, I will argue that uh, in spite or within the, the politics and uh, along with the politics, it is the city uh, that in the global era has emerged as a place of the major and political practices, social and political practices reconfiguring or at least challenging the existing society and social order. But in the words of the Saskia Assassin, it is just a recent fact that the city has been recognized as the heuristic space, a space capable of producing knowledge about some of the major transformation uh, of the urban era. And it, the last hundred years, uh, and the, especially in the first half of the 20th century, the study of the city was at the heart of the sociology. This is evident in the work of the Simmel, Weber, Benjamin, Lefebvre, and most prominently the Chicago School, especially Park and Wirth, both deeply influenced by the German thinkers. They all confronted the, the massive process of industrialization, urbanization, but also alienation and new cultural formation that they call it urbanity. Studying the city was not simply the studying the urban. It was about studying the major social processes of an era. However, the social evidence in the cities, even when not only urban, can provide a solid knowledge for the better understanding of the processes that are shaping our societies. In the addition, the spatial form and spatial practices of the city has always been associated with a socio-political order, like in the Greek polis, or most prominently in the Greek polis. And thus political orders and politics are historically also spatial orders. So in the Greek idea of polis and the Roman one of res publica, the concepts of the polity, the politics and policy tend to converge in the very idea of the city. It is the city that is simultaneously represents the place, the purpose and practices through which the political, but also the society can deliver to the community. So according to the Sertob, the city is a complex and barely visible conglomeration of patterns of its users and their social practices. According to Bourdieu, the social practice refers to the relationship between the human and the world that compromise all the fact that we perform in relation to the external physical, but most of all, social reality. In that sense, the relation between space and social practices could not be tackled without the strong focus on speciality. All the speciality was not quite present in a sense that architects are foreseeing it in the work of the social scientists. But in the words of Lefebvre, if there is no special innovation, if no special innovation occurs, if no new space is created, there must be a failure in the transition. 
So it is thus no uh, 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 surprise that the challenges of contemporary politics have emerged as an acquired presence in space and even more thinking about politics without the reference to space seem to corrupt and compromise its conceptual and practical relevance. In the same time, we can argue that thinking and discussing about the architect architecture and the creation of architecture without social innovation and its spatial emanation is depriving the debate of its essential theoretical and practical elements. Hence, in a society ram ramified by the crisis and the inequalities, the present fixed and conservative theoretical, social, but also spatial practices become obsolete and the manifestation of power through architecture and urban space finds itself confronted with the novel organizational structures and mobile practices defying the traditional and symbolic exercise of politics and speciality in the urban space. So there has been a profound challenge of the dominant paradigm of how we understand the society but we also how we understand and contemplate about the city. So, uh, in the words of uh, Stefano Boeri, there is a, in a moment when we try to describe the uh, urban environment and to depict our urban context in a convincing way, we must allow space, uh, different spaces for the different voices of the multiple subjects and interpretation angles without, without trying to condense them into the single narrative. So it is a sort of a paradigm shift that we probably have to face in a sense to try to open our consideration and understanding of the cities, but even more understanding of our uh, society. Because uh, uh, the fixed narratives that are still dominating most of the research and most of the theoretical ground, providing this what Stefano Boeri calls zenital morphology, the view from the above, so the top-down approach has to be, uh, has to be sub, uh, exchanged or provided with another uh, approach that will confront the exclusive or the exclusivity of the dominant theoretical but also social practices. And what he proposes uh, and also uh, following the, the idea and the work of uh, Robert Venturi to provide this uh, detective gaze or insight to, to look at from the inside the space, from inside, getting the insight uh, of the, what's going on in our cities. In only in that way, we will be able to understand the, the horizontal distribution of the uh, social and cultural concepts and to provide this bottom-up uh, shift and understanding of what is uh, happening in our cities. Hopefully, e enabling us to, to develop more inclusive, more sustainable, and co more smart uh, uh, concepts and uh, approaches and theoretical grounds uh, for our research. So in the words of Andrea Branzi, the architecture is seen rather as an activity which is less figurative and more enzymatic, which transforms the territory horizontally because it is the culture that is horizontal, spread out, that does not define the boundary that it change. So it is a territory that is almost infinite and that changes over the time, but which has never produced a cathedral, in other words, a powerful symbol. So we come to the point when the understanding of architecture for so uh, long uh, has been uh, considered uh, through the existence of the dualities. The duality that has been provided by the social theory and social sciences. Uh, architecture has been considered, in the words of Alvena Janeva, who provides, uh, in my opinion, uh, a new possibility or a, new, a possibility for the new approach to tower these uh, 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 challenges, provide us with an idea that we can conceptual architecture in a profoundly different way. She suggests the concepts of the mapping of the so-called architectural uh, controversy. She argues that the critical architectural theory has provided us with the numerous examples of oppositions, society, architecture, nature versus culture, reality versus rationality. But whenever architecture takes inspiration from sociology, 
says Janeva, it inevitably leads to the sociological reductionism. The vision that architecture reflects society is a myth. It's a myth. It's our myth. Arguing against one-sided interpretation of buildings as aesthetics or technical objects, critical theory was wedded to an assumption that a social context existed where architecture and urban activities, or even better to say, pre-existed where urban activities took place and which could explain their meaning and relevance. However, architecture should be understood not as a building and artifacts, but as a process performed on the textures of uncertainty. So critical theory, and specifically critical architectural theory, assumes that architecture is an activity that is capable of being understood only in wider comprehensions of the cultural productions. Hence, a building meaning can be grasped only when we unveil the hidden social determinants, uh, determinants behind architecture. So in spite of the need, or not uh, underestimating the need for the critical thinking, it is essential that the critical theory in this case must update what the society is made of, what social condition stands for, and to act upon social and transformative matter. Because the main challenge, the main problem here is that it took architecture and especially society as static entities. In an attempt to define architecture and the meaning behind the design of architecture, it forget to, to, to work on the uh, and to uh, grasp uh, the, the fact that the, the society, how we understand society, has utterly changed in the last uh, decades. So uh, Janeva proposed, instead of the, the critical uh, architectural theory, to uh, lean on the pragmatist or the pragmatist approach, where instead of reducing architecture to predefined knowns that fixes it into predetermined roles, she proposed the pragmatist approach that traces architecture as it unfolds in time, and reveal architecture in its uncertainties. Hence, she proposed the mapping of the controversies uh, in architecture, which means that, and I'm sure that uh, if you refer to her book uh, called Mapping the Ar Controversies in Architecture, uh, you will find a quite uh, helpful set of uh, contemplation and theoretical debate about the, the background of this uh, approach, but also some uh, examples how she proposed to trace the development, what she calls the controversy, of the projects developing in architecture. So uh, what does it provide? It's a, a, a suitable or comfortable tool to actually grasp the complexity of the process and also to uh, embed uh, all the different stakeholders that have been participating within this process, but also not just depicting the elements or the, the agents of the, the process, but the relation between them and the transformative power of these relations between them. So this is just a, a, an example of a, one of her uh, mapping of the London 2012 Olympic Stadium. Uh, in a different depiction, different illustration, so you can see it can always develop further uh, regarding to what aspect of the controversy and the process you are adding to. So if you want to uh, have a more profound, more in-depth uh, uh, and understanding of the process, you can go deeper and deeper or wider uh, into understanding these processes. And we can also as uh, seen here, make a, a map of the participation. I will not go into details. This map of the participation is uh, available on the internet and I can provide you for anybody who's interested. But it's a mind map of the community participation from many different perspectives. Not only trying to grasp uh, the theoretical background, but also some of the consequences and the results of the community participation and how it is uh, been influenced by different actors and uh, different uh, theoretical uh, foregrounds. So, leaning on this uh, theoretical background and the idea of mapping the process as it's uh, unveiled, as it, as it unfolds in time, I will show you um, two examples uh, of the mapping process, actually of the, the, the case studies that we did uh, with our students at the Faculty of Architecture in Skopje about the transformation that occurred in Skopje. One, 
will be the transformation that occurred in the 90s, uh, in the early 90s, when the, in Skopje, trying to understand uh, briefly, uh, the, there has been a profound change in the society in the 90s in the Eastern Europe, including Macedonia, was the time when the, the, there was a change of the social, societal system. So trans, uh, transforming from the uh, previous socialist uh, system to the open market economy. And that uh, process of change has uh, substantially uh, transformed not just the, the economic uh, relations between and financial relations within the society, but also addressed and uh, shaken the, the system of values and the practices uh, of the people uh, living there. So uh, Skopje uh, has been uh, tremendously affected uh, in it, uh, by this uh, transformation, especially because uh, in the last hundred years, uh, Skopje as a city has been part of the six different states. And uh, it, the, the, each time that the new elite, the, the new uh, ruling elite was established, they also brought their uh, new urban planning paradigm. So from the early 20th century, when the, in the, up to that point, uh, a, a small town with the almost oriental structure, because uh, the Ottoman Empire was present until the 1912, uh, in, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, a new uh, European uh, urban planning concept were introduced. And each time it was, as you will see in the future, each time it was the tabula rasa approach, like there was nothing there before and they were just implementing new ideas. And then uh, after the Second World War, there was a modernist uh, urban planning and you can see on the lower part of the image different urban plans that were following these uh, historic instances. Uh, 1949, uh, a modernist uh, planning uh, by Czech modernist uh, architect and urban planning, Ludia Kubes, with the completely impl implementation of the completely new modernist paradigm of the freestanding blocks in the greenery of the city. And then in 1963, Skopje was completely de destroyed in the earthquake, uh, with more than 80% of the building stocks either in ruins or heavily damaged. And with a huge international support, uh, there was a, a large redevelopment reconstruction process led by, uh, in particular for the center of the city, by the Japanese architect Kenzo Tange, yet again implementing some new uh, ideas and paradigms like the Japanese metabolism, based on the Japanese uh, metabolism and uh, structuralism at that time. And at the beginning of the, 90, of the 90s, uh, and uh, the independence of the Republic of Macedonia from the former federation, uh, an introduction of um, a postmodernist uh, urban design and architecture or regaining the identity of the Europe, of the classical European city. So you can see all the different um, role models or all the different theoretical and uh, planning models that have been implemented and used as a background for these plans. However, uh, the realization of all these plans has never been complete because of the historic occurrences and uh, that uh, each uh, urban plan has lasted for no more than two decades as a concept. And what uh, resulted that uh, in different parts of the city we have different fragments of different uh, urban plans. Uh, which creates a sort of a city of fragments of urban planning. So, and all these fragments are really in a walking distance. So you can walk from the uh, urban fragments and development that depicting the early 20th century classical European city with the boulevards and the perimetral blocks uh, next to the Ottoman Bazaar and then entering into the modernist neighborhood and then uh, facing the um, metabolist Japanese Kenzo Tange city wall residential structure. Uh, however, uh, this questions the very fundamentals of the city of Skopje. So if it's a city of fragments, what is it that makes the, the, the unique or the, the integral uh, image or the identity of this city? So we hope that uh, we try to grasp it into understanding what are the relations and what are the processes that are providing the integration of all these formal fragments and conceptual fragments into uh, a, a unique whole. Uh, and when we did that, uh, we referred to the transformation from the 90s, uh, where what happened is that uh, from the economic point of view, a huge uh, companies and uh, so-called the, the, the socialist giants 
uh, usually the factories producing, but also the, the companies uh, from the service industry, the big construction companies, failed. And a lot of people uh, find themselves without a job, unemployed. And uh, the thing is that the only possession that they had at that moment, because up to that point, up to the 90s, uh, all the property, uh, the real estate was in the possession of the state. And among the first uh, transformation laws was actually to uh, privatize the houses, the apartments, and the places where people live. So uh, it was really easy, according to that law, to, to buy out the place where you live, because previously you don't own the place, you don't own your apartment, but you own the right to use the apartment. So after this uh, transformation, people were able to buy the apartment of, I don't know, approximately 80 square meters for as less as like 200, 300 euros. So it was just a, a process of the privatization that mattered at that time. But it, uh, it occurred that this uh, privatization provided the people with the asset that in the moment when they find themselves uh, unemployed could uh, put uh, on the market. So they have exercised, and I have to stress that out, besides architects. So architects were very loosely uh, understanding what's going on at that time or not even uh, involved in that. But it was the citizens that actually understood this potential because they cannot provide for their family. They, they had no earnings uh, of any kind. So they understand that the, what they had in a position is the, the place that they live, the apartments. So uh, they were approached or they organized themselves in a small groups of so-called investors. And they initiated a new circle of the reconfiguration or uh, redevelopment on the sites of their houses and their uh, apartments. As I said, they were approached by the very small uh, entrepreneurs because of the, these big construction companies dissolved into very... Previously, before 90s, the, the, these construction companies from Macedonia, but also from the former Yugoslavia, were de working on the huge developments in, I don't know, in Libya, in Iraq, in, the, in Asia, throughout the world. And now they have been dissolved on the most of the time accompanied by the single owner uh, that is actually managing everything. So these uh, small entrepreneurs approach these uh, small owners of the houses and uh, suggest them to uh, actually uh, join uh, what he has as a knowledge and a capacity to, to, for the redevelopment and their possession. So uh, in this uh, sense, they were enabled to redevelop the, the sites uh, and the, the places where they live and to create new value. And suddenly, within the scope of one or two years, these uh, uh, individuals and families that has no earning of any kind suddenly has become the owners of several apartments, so they start renting and completely changing their uh, economic but also their social position. So uh, within this city of fragments, uh, we try also uh, to explore the border conditions between the fragments, but not uh, fragments not only of the physical entities, but also the fragments of the society. So uh, we try to grasp, and this is the image of the physical structure of the city of Skopje, the city as the incremental spatial and social practices and realities that are occurring, and try to learn out of them. So uh, this is the transformation that happened uh, as a result of this, processes, uh, the, this process that I just uh, explained, where the single uh, house or uh, even more uh, frequently a single uh, apartment block of uh, only on ground level has been transformed on these uh, apartment buildings uh, developing on the many levels. So even you can see that uh, on the building in the middle that uh, the old house or the old building is still there. It has been consumed in a way by the new development. So uh, this is uh, one of the result of one of our investigation and it, uh, it's a website uh, accessible. It's called Skopje Raste or Skopje Grows that is depicting the transformation of different parts of the city uh, in the several historic instances. In 1990s, the condition in 1990s, then in 2012, and then in 2020, according to the urban plan that is uh, in, in place at the moment. So you can see that, for example, in this part of the block, of the urban block, there are detached houses, mainly detached houses. So this is a condition in 1990s. 
and then we have the condition in 2012. So the redevelopment already started, in a sense, in this uh, block, but this is the situation according to the urban plan. So a process that it was initiated, in a way, from the bottom up, meaning uh, the, the, the owners of the apartments and with the small entrepreneurs initiating the redevelopment, was then accepted, in a way, by the, the city authorities and was formalized in a... Uh, in a, to the urban plans. This is another, more, probably even more illustrative case of an urban block. You can see the single houses. So this is already the development in 2012. You can see how it grows and how it... it it's not just the, the redevelopment. It's uh, uh, substantially changing the, the morphology and typology, not to mention the dissolution of the green spaces, the problem of the infrastructure, the problem of the parking space and everything. And this is how it, it, uh, it is uh, foreseen through the urban plan. So some diagrams explaining, you can see that in the, as I was mentioning previously, in the lower part, you can still see the, the outline of the existing building. Of course, it was refurbished. The facade of that building was uh, refurbished. But then you have like uh, double it or even more than double the development above the existing building. So in this uh, case, it's uh, un unrecognizable because the existing building was uh, completely consumed and sometimes, or most of the time, it was destroyed. And sometimes this redevelopment goes not just uh, above the existing uh, buildings, but even below the existing buildings. So they are using, at that time in the 90s, the small entrepreneurs and redevelopers were using every possibility to play within the, the legal frame and even digging uh, below the existing building to find, uh, to, to create some more square meters in order to, to, to maximize their profit. However, uh, this development, and this is one of the, the buildings uh, that is uh, clearly depicting it, is also a development that uh, we can, in a very probably vague uh, way, uh, f recognize the, the participation of the citizens. Why? Because if you go uh, into more details, you will see that on the each floor there is a different position of the window. So it was the, the, this building, this facade, is actually the result of the desires and the needs and the position of the each particular dweller to this redevelopment. So everybody was saying, I don't need a, a, a window. I will enjoy my terrace. Or I have no money for any kind of a development. Or I hate my neighbor. I don't want to enable them to, to redevelop the building. Or let's put it uh, up to the, the end of the facade and utilize it through two new rooms and have more square meters in the future. So this, in a sense, uh, depicts the, the architecture of the process. As you will see, the role of the architect was marginalized. I mean, completely. The, 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 the architect was just formalizing probably this process as a project document that was sent to the, the municipality for the construction permit. So there is no predetermined architectural uh, concept or, uh, or t even typology, but it was just the reaction to these processes shaping uh, the architecture in, uh, of the process. So we try to grasp and to understand this uh, knowledge, because I think there is still knowledge uh, present in these processes, and to work with our students on the similar cases, on the similar sites in Skopje, and trying to understand and to develop some alternative, probably, models of the transformation. So, but in the same time, not just working on the typology and on the morphology or the urban redevelopment, but also trying to understand the logic behind this uh, uh, transformation. Meaning, uh, thinking and providing the, the financial or economic models, not just for financing of the redevelopment, but also of the post-occupancy or the, the, the ongoing uh, uh, economic feasibility of the dweller in the in the same place. So we can, you can see on this uh, one of the, the projects that was developed uh, together with our students within the design studio and I have brought the book that we publish uh, after each of the design studios so you will be able to see it. Um, so we try for example in this uh, case study to provide uh, not just uh, the development or redevelopment of the existing house but also to provide an attachment that is uh, located, uh, conveniently located in the uh, backyard, 
that would not be just the extension of the living space for the family or the families, but also could provide some economic activity for the family, like renting on Airbnb or providing a space for some creative uh, individuals, creative industry representatives and so on. So we tried to go into more detail. So the design studio was entitled uh, Patterns of uh, Growth, uh, Micro City. And we tried to understand, to go into more small scale and to, to grasp uh, the, this uh, micro scale of the redevelopment. So different occurrences, different uh, situation, uh, different challenges when it comes to, to the brief and to the program. So our students, as we were discussing yesterday, were asked also to work on the development of the program, not just to, to, to react on the design challenge or to react on the uh, previously defined brief, but rather to try to understand what the, are the needs and what are the possibilities for the re redevelopment. And uh, once uh, developing the proposals, we also, we went, because at the very beginning we went to the neighborhood and discussed it with the owners of the apartments. And when we developed the proposals together with our students, we asked our students to go back again to the, to the neighborhood and to discuss again uh, and to contemplate together with the owners of the apartments about uh, whether they uh, see it as a feasible, whether it's uh, something that they have been considering in that way, what are the downfalls, what are the potential of this redevelopment. So you can see, for example, this uh, development provides uh, a, a platform in the middle of the block, a platform that should utilize different uh, social and spatial practices of the local community and the dwellers here. So from the workshop to the playground to the small uh, kindergarten all the way to uh, places that can be rented and that can uh, uh, house uh, some of the, the, the local uh, craftsmen and so on. So different shapes and different uh, possibilities were explored in a as I said, the design studio called Micro City, where we try to understand and to use the knowledge embedded in the city and within the community to shape uh, the, the, the architecture through the process of creation of architecture. So the, the aim of this uh, studio was uh, mapping the process, but even more understanding the process and using it into the design studio. So coming back to the uh, to the image of the, the Richard Hamilton. Uh, nowadays, I think uh, community participation has changed in a sense that the society and how we understand our society and how we utilize the communication between uh, our friends, between our uh, partners, between all the members of the community in a way that uh, this uh, imagery depicts. So you can see that there is always a sort of a provocation that exists in a society. So this is the uh, depiction of the family that is not all ceased to exist as a standard family. So we have um, uh, a family and uh, a husband and a wife that are already socially engaged and exposed to the publicity, trying to create their own identity into this newly created environment of the home. So layering these different layers of the possibility and inter uh, of communication and interaction that is shaping uh, our everyday lives, probably we can find the knowledge that is suitable and valuable for better understanding of the process of design. So within, this, uh, within the concept of Andrea Branzi, who, who entitles it uh, Vic Urbanism, where all the different instances and elements of the process, but also of the cities, are more diffuse, more distributed, more vague, and more temporary, we can probably try to think about the economy of the innovation, but most importantly, we must think about the social innovation because what, uh, what is connecting the architecture of the process without architects and the process of architecture with architects is actually the social innovation that we are embedding within this process, hopefully leading toward the more just, more sustainable, 
but also smart communities. Thank you. So as I said, I brought uh, for Carla <laughs> this book. Uh, we are organized. This is a, a, a result of the design studio in the ninth semester uh, that we are doing with our student. And we always produce uh, a, a, a little brochure, a little book, trying to not just grasp what has been done there, but also how we did it. And I also brought uh, the book from the last year, from the design studio. It's a pattern of uh, growth. but. Uh, with a different conceptual point of view, based on the Architectura della Città by Aldo Rossi and how we conceive the architecture of the city. So please uh, feel free to, to, to have it and uh, after that to, to give it to Carlos. Yes, please do. Yes, please do. Yes. provide financial models? They actually design the sort of financial business process of it? They don't provide financial no. models. They, they, we, they, right. we put them in a position to, to Think start about thinking about. Yeah, because I think it's one of all the challenges when you students do design projects which are about what the community wants. Is there so much unknown, isn't there? And um, you have I don't know, I, I always struggle with it. I mean, students end up doing, showing how a building might live in, be lived in in multiple different ways. But it comes down to those sort of uh, strategy documents and user guides and things, isn't it? Uh, um, so, so what exactly, well, I'll see the book, but <laughs> what do the students deliver when they're, they're producing a project like this? So, uh, as you can see, they deliver Architectural design. design yeah. Yes, so it's architectural design, but uh, as I mentioned, it, uh, they, they are also asked to develop the program. So not just the design, but also the, the challenge, the design challenge, and the, the, the uh, set of functions or the set of uh, amenities and uh, uh, different, uh, or, or at least to, to foresee how different processes can occur in that uh, sense. So not responding to the predefined program, but rather developing a program as a reflection and as a result of un hopefully understanding of the processes that are occurring there. Because what was interesting for us is that uh, we have been uh, obviously interested in the, this transformation from the 90s, which in some parts are still ongoing. And what occurred uh, is that uh, in the m most of the redevelopments, especially in the residential areas, what used to be solely residential area now is populated with apartment buildings, mm -hmm. but many apartments has been transformed into the work of uh, the places of work. So, in a residential apartment, uh, uh, in a residential building, you have an apartment that is a lawyer's office, so it's an office. But even more, uh, you have on the top, uh, sometimes there is a hostel, and then you have, uh, I don't know, uh, even some uh, dentist office and uh, some shops on the, the for some kindergartens, like small-scale kindergartens within these apartments. So we thought it's important to grasp this, uh, the potential, not that we are acknowledging that it's the right way to develop a residential building, but we were trying to understand what's behind it. So it is the, probably uh, in my uh, understanding is that uh, it is this need of the owners of the apartments, but also of the real estate, to provide certain flexibility in the time of the crisis. So it it enables them to to react fast and. Uh, by transforming the, the space uh, and the program into something that is more uh, profitable at the moment. And uh, in the same time, uh, we try to, to understand how we can uh, learn from these processes, but also develop better architecture, <laughs> and, or to be more specific, more, more, more accurate, better architectural models of development. So not 
only in the sense of the typology, even less on the sense of the aesthetics, but rather the models or the concepts, architectural concepts, that will recognize the potential of these processes and enable it within the more sustainable, more just way. Because, of course, having this kind of a transformation also brings a, a, a confrontation, a conflict, because if you have, I don't know, an apartment and you have an office or, a, I don't know, a kindergarten uh, in an apartment above you, it's a problem. <laughs> I mean, it's a problem in many different ways, from the security to, to the financial aspects and so on. Nevertheless, uh, this is the, the uh, let's say, uh, the result of this uh, strange period of the transformation in the 90s, where everything was in change and nothing was solid, to say so. So everything was possible. So we tried to understand what is uh, the, 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 the potential of it. We had, uh, uh, for example, a lecture by uh, a colleague from uh, Vienna Architecture Centrum. And he said, I'm uh, very much interested in the Balkan area in the last two decades because so many things are happening here because of the, the you know, lack of uh, legal frame, lack of the political frame, lack of everything. And in the same time in Austria, you cannot, you can't do anything. I mean, everything is all predefined, predetermined. It's, everything is fixed. So you cannot uh, foresee any kind of innovation in the field of, uh, of uh, social innovation or innovation in the, the, the architectural concepts. I know that, that sounds as a, as a good thing, but <laughs> also living in, in a place like that is also challenging. I really like the way you, you told the story, it was so clear. Um, so are the plan so there's no planning laws around this, or are they, so are they going to put some planning laws in place? No, no, there, there are a lot of planning laws right. in place, <laughs> and uh, there are many levels of planning, uh, but uh, what I was referring is the, the early 90s when the, all the, the system was changing, yeah. and there were many practices which were on the verge, on the edge of the legality, yeah. <laughs> to say so. Uh, but the thing is that uh, as a reaction to this uh, uh, disorder, the local governments, but even the central government through the legislation, put a very conservative approach. So they say, this is the detailed urban plan, I will give you the lines where you can build and that's it. So no possibility for the exploration and most of the time this is a, a, a very banal footprint of some urban designer doing the, the urban plan, you know, without uh, taking into consideration the capacity for the innovation and to, for the development of the community. So that's why we try to, to in a sense, uh, approach uh, with a more strategic thinking and trying to understand the redevelopment from the point of view of the strategy, but always ending up with the architectural design, because that's what we do. That's where we are feeling comfortable with. So 